It has been a very, very long time, but um, not much has happened. You know, life happens. Kids um, grow up, need trips to school, whatnot. It's very busy, and um, you know I don't I don't do a lot of my research um, for any kind of um, uh, compensation um, or any real strategy for making money. That probably needs to change in the future because I do have a number of ideas I need to test, but don't have the money to do it. Um, but uh, hopefully that will change. I don't longer I no longer have a monetized YouTube, which is one of the reasons why a lot of things have slowed down. Um, on my channel as far as I think sharing what I've been working on. But there has been quite a few uh, developments. Um, I just real quick before I get into this, let me just show you a study. I found this study the other day, uh, continuing my research, the idea that electricity could be used to um, uh, cut rock. And it turns out I'm not the only one to think of this. It's been being researched right now in Russia. They're doing it right now. So we'll go through this uh, real quick. I just wanted to highlight some things is that uh, they're doing this through sedimentary rock, so granite, um, and they channel the electrical discharge penetrates through solid dielectric. So uh, solid dielectric, like, you know, the, um, the properties that you find in a lot of sedimentary rock, you know, the quartz, the, 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 the feldspar, uh, the mica, those are all dielectrics within the rock. And they inject a liquid dielectric. What's a li liquid dielectric that we know of? You know, water. <laughs> water is a liquid dielectric. Uh, they put it in the rock and they pulse it in a period of one to 10 microseconds. This is like an electric, it's like a static discharge. They are statically discharging into rock and they are cutting it to the point where they are getting results that are on par with some of them advanced mining drilling. So they're saying that the uh, discharge channel of the rock allows to conclude that the rock drilling at depths of down to 3,500 meters is possible. And this is with static discharge into water, into rock with water as a base. It's proven science at this point. And um, all I am trying to suggest is that a capacitor is easier to make than a wheel and that the ancients mastered this technology long ago and the reason why we can't find the tools necessary to do high technology with machinery or diamond bit saws the reason why we can't find that stuff is because they weren't using it they were using static discharge and we find gold and wood and glass all the time because that's all you need to make a capacitor Conductor, insulator, conductor, capacitor, and they charge it with atmospheric electricity. And it's just a slow charge. You slowly charge it. And once it gets into its um its um whatever capacitor they're using, they can have a larger capacitor, then dumb it down to smaller capacitors through a small transformer system they could easily have done. Uh, it just seems so silly at this point where we dis like I, I've seen some st studies where um the human genome is like 200,000 years old, but we only have written history for the last 10,000 years and less, um, arguably less, because even things that have written that far, long ago, we don't even take them. We, we take them as a grain of salt. We don't believe them, which gets me to my next point is the writings of Plato and the claim of Atlantis. Um, at one, I'm going to just preface this is at one time people thought the city of Troy was fiction. Um, Many of many people have written about Troy in the past, and until you have the work of guys like um, uh, Schliemann, uh, who went out and dug in the ground and followed the clues from Homer's writings, they actually found the city of Troy, and it's no longer like it's no longer in dispute. Like Troy was a real place. Now the the, the details of how much of the Trojan War are still debated within that community, but Troy was real. And the idea that, that we can look at older historians, and even if we can't put the pieces together ourselves today, maybe there were some factors that changed the recipe. Um, in, the, in the case of Plato, it was re just recently pointed out on a great channel I love. It's called Bright Insight. 
um, was brought up brought up this theory that Atlantis um, was a real place and it was located at what we call the Eye of Africa or the this Rakat structure. And you can see this uh, this structure is you know quite a bit. This is like 600 miles from the modern coast today. But the thing that's um, that's interesting about this is that its dimensions. Um, I think like Plato describes it was a uh, concentric circles, basically with moats. Um, the outer ring, like this, the size, like they, I think they call it like three strata or something like that. Um, Bright Insight does a great, um, great job of detailing the size and structure. And it's, it's, it's a match. It's pretty, it's within, you know, uh, meters. It's, it's very close. And this is in the, in the condition it is in today. And you have to ask, you know, what could have caused such a great catastrophe where this is the state of Atlantis today, where this used to be an island connected to the ocean. And uh, the thing that, the very first thing I thought of was just looking at these satellite images and just seeing like these streaks of desert sand. And when you come to, come to realize how big these streaks are, these runoffs, these are fantastically huge. Like, like you can when you get closer, you can kind of see what the wind does to them, and the the pattern of the wind doesn't account for the macro pattern on the larger scale. This is not the same, and um, it got me to thinking was just basically look in the direction of these lines, and that brought me over to Cape Verde, and the thing that I did was just research, you know, what kind of paths. Like perhaps volcanic activity could explain perhaps a tidal wave um, that may have decimated the, um, the, co the, um, the geography of Africa at the time. That may have not even looked like this. The coastline may have not been here. The coastline may have been up here. This may have been water. The um, northern Morocco and Algiers, this might have been an island. With water in the Mediterranean, with impassable uh, wetlands, and the whole idea of this idea of going through the Pillars of Hercules, which is the, the Strait of Gibraltar today, uh, and coming out here and coming to the city of Atlantis, as um, is described by Plato, it, the idea is that the land may have not looked the way it did today, and the reason why so many people have not been able to find. Atlantis, as Plato describes, was because of a catastrophic event. And as I did research, I found the catastrophic event was here on the island of Fobo. The island of Fobo um, had a major uh, collapse. It's already been proven. Um, uh, they, they estimate anywhere between like 40,000 to 75,000 years ago, which is puts the time frame for Atlantis very long. you got to keep in mind that when Plato was shown the hieroglyphs for the history of Atlantis, it was already ancient by that time. And if this is true, and, this, and the dating of the study is correct, we're placing human, uh, advanced human civilization much further beyond anything that we've ever heard of. Now let's look at this, uh, the Phobo collapse. Phobo collapse, this, this red outline represents where the debris is found today. And what happens at the eastern flank of uh, Fogo collapses into the ocean, displacing about 150 uh, cubic kilometers of rock into the ocean. This caused a kind of a bubble tidal wave to hit the island of Santiago um, with waves as high as 800 feet or more. And the reason why they were able to determine the strength of this was this the principle of the study was the idea of um, finding boulders that were basically dislodged on the island uh, on the western side of Santiago and then pushed inland. So they're basically calculating the strength of the tsunami that occurred based on the idea of how far giant boulders were moved. And so with this information, like there's other studies that have even concluded other islands, like uh, there's a study out right now um, talking about a future tsunami doomsday prediction, right? Where I think, I believe it's in um, a volcano in here. All of these are like volcanoes are very unstable. And one of these has the potential to collapse in a westward direction um, with the same amount of displacement, uh, that kind of the 120 to 150 range 
of uh, cubic kilometers or kilometers cubed. And they estimate that that would send a shockwave far enough to actually flood much of the western, uh, eastern coast of the United States with um, you know, 10 meter high waves. So if that has enough energy to travel across the Atlantic, pick up enough momentum to then decimate much of the east coast just by you know, the math of how much the potential displacement would be. We have a study where that displacement did occur in the past, and it was right here funneled east. In that same direction, in that same cone, like when we look at this cone of this displacement going into the northeastern direction, it is the exact, it's like northeast-east. The same northeast-east direction, it's directly at the Rukat structure. And these flows of sand, almost like it was carried at one time with water, devastated wetlands, flooded into the, the oceans of the time completely rewriting what the land may have looked like. And the reason why that there, Plato even discussed a land mass that was bigger than, um, than Asia um, was the idea that maybe because of the wetlands, they did not know that Eastern Africa was also connected to this body of land on the west side of Africa. So you have this like split in the middle of wetlands, impassable mountains. They knew about Ethiopia. They called this the land, the Egyptians called this the land of the gods. Um, maybe they knew about some of this coast over here, but they didn't know that the world over here was the same land. And they knew a, la a massive landmass existed. And that's what was written in Plato's, in Plato's writings. And that we look at this is that when we look at the, the eye of history, we also have to look at the eye of the history of geography and how the land may have changed and uh, may have been completely augmented like all this they've already found all this sand that's in like a, most of the sand is comes from the ocean they already know that it's already proven but what i'm proposing is that we have a proven study of a tsunami producing collapse we have another study that shows the impact of such a collapse and we have a theory of a missing city that was buried beneath the waves and the reason why we wouldn't con that people have not been able to find it is because the waves receded and the face of the land was changed. And the, the, the city of Atlantis, or what was, once was the city of Atlantis, has been visible from space for <laughs> as long as we've been taking pictures of the Earth in this way. Like we're looking at technology that's not has not been on the round uh, on Earth for a number of decades to the public. Uh, Google has made this a um, uh, more accessible, and then people just have not been looking. I think once more people look at this connection, we found a very huge uh, event that would have reshaped much of the known world at that time and put a reset on the known uh, on the known civilizations of the time. This could be the origin of, of the flood story, the flood of the known world, and the idea of an ark surviving could very well have been the Egyptian colony um, that uh, play, uh, that's discussed by Plato is that the idea that the Egyptian landmarks were built by, Atlant I guess you call them Atlanteans, I'm not sure what you want to call them, but this, civil this lost civilization built a colony in Egypt, and Egypt was an extension of it. And if we think a lot of the great things of Egypt were are impressive – and ancient and old, it's not just, you know, um, early dynasty constructions, but mu much older. And we can attribute that to a people that we know little about because their artifacts are likely buried beneath the desert sand. Anyway, just want to share that, get that out there. It's been a long time. I'm hoping to do maybe a Patreon in the future. I want to do the static thing. I want to demonstrate that myself. And once I can show you that with a few capacitors in a homebrew experiment, I will cut rock. I already know, I already know it's possible. I, I, I see it in my mind. I see studies that are already doing it too. It's only a matter of time where I can do that demonstration for you. And I can then feel that would be the appropriate time to launch a Patreon of some kind to where you can help me with that research, where I can push forward the idea of an ancient technology once lost being rediscovered today.
and that you can be a part of it. Thank you very much.